So hello and welcome to today's webinar on visible speech mapping. My name is Megan and I am an audiologist working with Interacoustics in Australia. I've been using visible speech mapping I guess since its inception with Interacoustics and I really find it to be an essential tool for clinicians to use in hearing aid fittings. So I want to take a slightly different view on the topic of visible speech mapping today and concentrate on the benefits that it has for clinicians. So I really want to keep this simple title as our focus for today. So as clinicians, why should we be doing it? I'm then going to cover how to perform visible speech mapping just in brief, but go into a deeper discussion about the benefits for the clinician when interpreting the results. And throughout the latter part of the webinar, I'm also going to be providing you with a number of case studies. And these are taken from my office and really show you the benefits of visible speech mapping in a live setting. But before we do jump into what visible speech mapping is, I do want to take just a few minutes to have a look at why perhaps traditional real ear measurements have started to go out of favour and what the issues with them can be. So some of the problems we encounter with real ear measurements are to do with the type of stimuli we use. So the gains that are achieved for real life signals, say such as speech or music, can differ considerably from the gains measured with steady signals, such as a warble tone shown here, or noises or other pure tones. And the difference really can depend on the number of channels in the hearing aid, the speed of the compressors and the compression thresholds. We also have feedback cancellation systems which can interfere with pure tones and affect output. So the greater the input we try and produce with the hearing aid, the feedback mechanism can reduce that hearing aid level. So we get this circular issue where you keep turning up the aid to match target and the hearing aid feedback cancellation system keeps putting it back down. And this can really all happen in the background of a real ear measurement without you really knowing about it. And this is similar to noise reduction features as well. They can switch on when you're doing a real ear measurement in the traditional sense and again interfere with the output in a similar um, behaviour to the feedback cancellation systems. Now whilst we can deactivate these systems before commencing REM, this won't give the clinician or the hearing aid user the really the correct idea about what's going on at the eardrum level in the real scenario of everyday life. And in everyday life, we really don't find the traditional REM signals present anywhere. You know, they really have no relevance um, to the listener or to their companions. And it can make the measurements seem a little bit meaningless. And I liken this to why we do speech audiometry. So we don't just rely on the pure tone audiogram because we need to understand how the brain is going to cope with speech signals. And we're doing a little bit the same here with the hearing aid evaluations. You know, how is the hearing aid coping with a speech input? So as clinicians at the end of doing a traditional real ear measurement, we may feel that um, it, it's left us with that feeling, I guess, of a, oh, that was a little bit of an arbitrary task. What is that really showing me? There's really no comparison to how the hearing aid is functioning in the client's day-to-day -day life. And also when we're unsure about how that noise reduction or um, feedback mechanism is working at the time and then how much improvement in speech is my client receiving with their hearing aids uh, when we're not using a speech based stimuli. And this really takes us on to performing visible speech mapping. And I've defined it here as a visual fitting technique showing clinicians the most accurate account of a hearing aids functionality by using simulated speech stimuli. So this term speech mapping, I guess, is exactly that. We're mapping out how the hearing aid reacts to speech across the frequency and intensity domains. And a major advantage, I guess, of speech mapping approach is that the effective amplification provided by the hearing aid can be assessed using realistic signals such as speech or music. And it's also done with the hearing aid in its normal mode of operation. So with those features such as feedback cancellation and noise reduction are enabled. So then the influence of factors such as the number and um, bandwidth of channels, compression speed are all taken into account. So then effectively after doing the measurement, what you see is what you get. 
So we have this visual display of the hearing aid's performance. The uncertainties and errors may be produced by those artificial test signals are avoided. Um, and we have an idea of how the hearing aid is functioning with the given stimulus that we've presented and visually displayed on our screen. So what kind of result are we looking at when we're doing visible speech mapping? I guess in its most basic form, it sort of resembles a traditional REM result, but there are distinct visual differences. Um, and we are mostly interested in the dynamic range for the fitting, and then secondary to that, the stimulus as well. So firstly on the screen, we see this upper limit or the patient's uncomfortable loudness level. And then we then have this lower range or the lower limit, which is their audiometric thresholds. And between this space is our dynamic fitting range. We need to be able to have the hearing aid produce audible and meaningful sound whilst not being too loud for any given stimulus, so ensuring that it doesn't touch that upper limit. And lastly, we see our result. So the solid red line is the average intensity for a given stimulus, I mean generally that is 65 dB. And then we have the shaded area around the result, or perhaps our second dynamic range if you like. Now this result here displays a percentile analysis and we will cover that shortly along with our dynamic ranges. They're really two crucial aspects to visible speech mapping. So why would you do visible speech mapping as a clinician? And we've covered why traditional REM measurements may not be suitable anymore, um, but what additional benefits does visible speech mapping have that we can utilise? I find that the overriding benefit of performing this is for the clinician. It really helps us to understand how the hearing aid is operating. And we can do this through verification. So um, performing and ensuring uh, what we think the hearing aid is doing at the computer level is actually delivering that in the ear. It also helps with better troubleshooting. So why isn't my client hearing well, even though the hearing aid software says they should be? So this incorporates this value of the visual for the clinician. Having this material presented visually on your screen can increase retention of it. And also we'll have a, a little look later at some examples where the visual cues are essential to knowing some of the restrictions and parameters which can be affected with hearing thresholds. So it leads us to assisting the clinician to maybe know what rehabilitation techniques to implement you know, during the hearing aid journey. And following with this is really the ability to better monitor the hearing aid adjustments. Again, we can have a look at um, rehabilitation counselling techniques and also perhaps instrument breakdowns or errors with the hearing aid that may come up. I feel too as clinicians we also require some level of satisfaction that what we've said the hearing aid is doing for the client is actually performing in that fashion. I mean surely some of our clinical judgments can come into question if there's a poor fitting or poor outcome. And visible speech mapping is certainly one way which we can achieve greater satisfaction. And, and two, for the patient or client, um, they may be very unfamiliar with terms such as, you know, is that too tinny or is that too sharp? They haven't heard these sounds in a long time and suddenly being asked these questions can be very dis difficult for them to provide an accurate account of what's going on. You know, through the Mark Track studies from Caution, we know that about five out of ten hearing aid satisfaction criteria for the end user is about sound quality. So we need to ask ourselves as clinicians, how can we assure that this is being achieved? And this would then directly relate on to counselling. You know, some of these counselling questions that we need to ask ourselves, you know, is the hearing aid doing what I'm promising my client? And is it accurate compared to their prescriptive targets? Um, and most importantly, is it addressing their expectations? You know, often visible speech mapping has focused on how these results can be used to counsel clients um, on the performance and expectations. And there is uh, the limited possibility in certain cases where this style of direct counselling by explaining the visible speech mapping result to a client or parent could be warranted and, and certainly meaningful. Uh, and in um, the case studies that I'm presenting towards the end, we'll see a few examples of that. 
So I guess we need to have a look at the, the basic principle behind visible speech trapping, and that is that it is a real ear-aided response. So we're measuring the amplification output at the eardrum level, and it's displayed in dBSBL. We have a probe tube in place with the hearing aid in and switched on, and hanging below the ear is our reference microphone, which is also where we take our unaided responses from. So it differs to the real ear aided response by the algorithms performed on the stimulus presented and displayed, but in essence, it is still a real ear aided response. I feel it's important to talk about that uh, the primary goal will still be to match the hearing aid output to either a research-based um, prescriptive target, such as NAL or DSL, or a proprietary manufacturer-derived target, such as from Oticon or Bernafon. So how do we perform visible speech mapping? Uh, it's really four easy steps. Um, we select the audiogram and calibrate the probe tube. And in this instance, we're demonstrating the Callisto machine. We can place the probe tube into the client's ear. We then place the hearing aid in the client's ear and switch the hearing aid on. And then in our software, we perform visible speech mapping. So I'm now going to show you a video of visible speech mapping. Now we can see the result running on screen. We really need to know how to interpret this data and how to know what to do with the data that comes up on screen. Uh, there are already two fabulous quick guides available on the Interacoustics Academy website, which my colleague Lee Martin has produced. These two guides will walk you through the explanation of the visible speech mapping both with and without results, and so I'd heavily encourage you to view these after today's webinar. Now, given they're so comprehensive, I'm going to walk you through some of the basics on the screen displays whilst we talk about how to interpret the results. From the results we just saw coming up on the screen, what are some of the types of outcomes that we can analyse? And today I'm going to be talking about the dynamic range, matching to a prescriptive target, the speech intelligibility index, percentile analysis, hearing aid features, and a little bit on counselling. This list isn't by any means exhaustive, and there are certainly other factors, uh, say, such as the speech banana, maybe peaks and valleys, uh, different ways of using the percentile analysis, and so forth. Um, but today I find these are the most beneficial uh, and probably the first steps that you go to when you start to use visible speech mapping, so we're going to concentrate on them. As I mentioned at the start of the webinar, the dynamic range is one of the most useful and basic tools available. We can again see the threshold limits down the bottom and the uncomfortable loudness levels, and that then gives us the dynamic range in the middle. Given this loss is mild to moderate, as you can probably imagine, we should probably see a good improvement in hearing aid performance um, after, rather after amplification. The left-hand graph is showing us the unaided view, whilst the right with an aided shows us a jump in that amplification. Now, although this dynamic range is large, given the mild nature of the hearing loss, we will see uh, in just a moment a good case of how beneficial it is to know your dynamic range limits and what the restrictions on a hearing aid fitting can be. So you may be performing visible speech mapping for a variety of reasons um, of what we covered at the start, but the primary goal does remain, and that is to match target for an objective verification measure. Uh, we may adjust the hearing aid settings for troubleshooting and for client preference, but we don't want to deviate too far from a prescriptive target to ensure that we're not causing over or under amplification, which can affect our speech intelligibility and even, as you know, cause, cause damage. Besides the additional information you're getting on this screen, it is still an REAR fitting, and you will notice on this screen that we don't have an uncomfortable loudness level displayed, and that is because we're using a now prescriptive formula, uh, and that does not show a predicted upper limit unless you measure your uncomfortable loudness levels in the audiogram. But you could flick over to DSL for a predicted limit in this case. The speech intelligibility index, um, although 
a complicated algorithm in the background. Uh, in its simplest form, it's calculated by determining the proportion of speech information that is audible across a number of frequency bands. To calculate it, uh, we need frequency specific information about say speech levels, noise levels, auditory threshold, and also the importance of speech. So it gives us this quantification of uh, a proportion or a percentage in our case of speech information that's audible and usable for a listener. A basically a uh, speech intelligibility index of say 0% implies that none of the speech information in a given setting is available to improve speech understanding. So it's not audible or usable. On the other extreme, a speech intelligibility index of 100% implies that all the speech information in a given setting is audible and usable. Now those extreme numbers will never occur as something is always generally heard, so 0% is not possible. But what you will see is a jump from the unaided speech intelligibility score to the aided one. Now there are a few key things to understand with speech intelligibility index and that is that it doesn't imply understanding and we're going to have a look at this on the next slide with percentile analysis. But a score of say 60% may mean something is usable or audible but doesn't necessarily equate to understanding. But with other environmental and cognitive clues um, a score of 60% may mean 90% of the speech was understood. Another important factor to note is that you may find patients um, have a lower than anticipated score. This is the case for individuals to say a moderately severe hearing loss or worse, um, even after you're perfectly matching your target. The client may not complain of tolerance issues but will come in and complain of speech understanding issues. So this is a really good case where uh, the gain for say soft to moderate sounds, particularly in the high frequency regions, could be increased to help aid speech understanding. And the last important factor is that um, you know, we're regularly asked, well, what number am I trying to achieve or what difference am I trying to look at? Um, there is no number or jump that you're hoping to see, um, but you do want to ensure that the, the numbers are different because it, it all really all depends on the environment um, and also the stimuli that you're using. So this is the percentile analysis I mentioned at the start and possibly our, you know, what I've sort of coined our second dynamic range. Uh, and we can investigate this, it relates to the range that the hearing ad reacts to a given stimulus. And in this instance we're looking at um, the percentile analysis function and again uh, there is another fantastic quick guide which fully explains the percentile analysis in visible speech mapping. Um, and you will find this a, a very useful aspect. The stimuli that we use for visible speech mapping is shaped according to the long-term average of the speech spectrum or the task. Entity of this has very complex properties uh, in time and frequency domains. The percentile analysis is a standard method for evaluating these properties of the stimuli and also of the sounds provided at the ear level. So in the sample on the screen, we have the 99th percentile selected and the 30th percentile selected at the bottom. The red line in the middle is being the average intensities of the measurement for this stimulus, so you can use this average line to match targets. The dynamic range which we can use between those two black lines allows us to fully comprehend the hearing aids functionality for this given stimulus. Now the easiest way I find to use this graph for interpretation is that the 99th percentile demonstrates that really nothing in this stimulus reached higher than this top black line. And given that it's also above the client's audiometric thresholds, we could also say that the client found all of this audible. We then turn to the 30th percentile. And we really ignore anything below 30% because it's not considered to be significant for audibility or intelligibility. You know, this could be things such as extraneous fan noises or other un unwanted environmental noises. 
And we can now look again at the audiometric thresholds um, and this bottom back line and see if it is above the audiometric thresholds like the 99th percentile is. Now if it is, we can assume that the person both heard and could make use of this stimuli to aid in speech understanding. Or for simplicity's sake, we could say that they likely understood it as well. Now we know it's a little bit more complicated from the speech intelligibility index that I mentioned before, um, but it is an easy way as a clinician when you're fitting and you're in the live situation and you're under time pressure to have a quick look at this um, and sort of make some assumptions. Now this result doesn't completely display that. Um, and you can see here that the 30th percentile isn't in fact above their audiometric thresholds. And then you just need to make a clinical judgment on the rest of the result. Are we fairly confident that this person with that level of improvement is going to perform well? And indeed, uh, we should have a look at whether their speech intelligibility index has increased, which um, it should have. So this is the first of the four case studies we're having a look at today and it's showing a mild to moderately severe sloping sensory neural hearing loss. Now this client's likely going to come into you complaining of difficulty in noisy situations, restaurants, large groups and they've likely had the issues uh, for quite a while. Now whilst the hearing aid is providing benefit which we can certainly see from the visible speech mapping result, it does also highlight an area of concern in the high frequencies. And although we have a good match to target, which is the key aspect to keep in mind, um, we may never achieve fantastic speech intelligibility in, due to the severity of loss and the lack of dynamic range, particularly in this high frequency region. You know, we can't increase the hearing aid volume as we're going to run into uncomfortable loudness difficulties. And we know that volume doesn't necessarily improve intelligibility. And of course, we need to keep that target matching in the forefront of our minds. So alternative factors could then play a part, so our rehabilitation counselling techniques now need to come into play and this can involve all the typical things of counselling on seating and lighting and environmental cues. And we could also have a look at the instruments we've selected, so the hearing aid compression abilities, the attack and release onset times. We may want to introduce a second program or a volume control for them. Some form greater control for this client to try and get the best speech intelligibility intelligibility that we can in their different environments. And we could also use this to counsel the client if suitable, show them the graph and explain the issues in basic terms that we might come up with and why you've chosen a particular hearing aid to try and fit them with. I find this a really good way to stop um, what I call those circular clients. So they're the clients that come in, you fitted them up and they take the devices away and they trial them in a particular setting. They come back in and they say, oh, I really just like this one thing turned up a little bit. And you talk to them about that, you tweak the hearing aid and they go away, they try it again in another situation, they come back, I'd like that changed and I'd like something else tweaked. You know, you can see from the visible speech mapping results that you wouldn't get in a normal traditional REM result, that those changes are likely going to be redundant. You know, hopefully having a better understanding as clinicians of what the hearing aid is going to achieve and our limitations will allow us to better counsel the client on their expectations and stop them revolving through our clinic door in this circular nature and at the end of um, the fitting certainly be more satisfied with what the hearing aid's doing. Our second case study is going to show us how relying on hearing aid manufacturer's software isn't always the best course of action. So it's essential to check everything objectively to assure, ensure that the right amount and type of sound is being delivered to the client. So you can see here in the high frequency region from about 1000 hertz onwards on the right hand graph that it starts to plateau out. Now given their loss and the target range in the high frequencies, we are coming in really well under what we'd like to see for improved speech intelligibility. Now this was a first fitting or you, they may call it acclimatisation step one that's been done through manufacturer software. Now as a clinician, if I was the person fitting and was finding this to be the initial setup or it was too loud after matching target, 
I'd be quite reluctant just to reduce the high frequencies here because that's where they need assistance and particularly cutting out off 1000 onwards where really there are still a lot of essential speech cues to be had in those frequency regions. So I think this is a good example of why we're needing verification through these objective measures like visible speech mapping. I'd like to talk about some of the hearing aid features and I think as clinicians we want to know that the features the hearing aid is promising is actually being delivered and achieving that goal. You can use visible speech mapping to investigate and record all of these functions working. And it's really easy to achieve this, you know, we can add in noise through your computer speaker or additional speakers you might have set up um, and we can particularly use the live voice functionality to do this. We could speak behind the end user to check for directional microphones. You could introduce noise on one side and speak on the other. And we can also make loud noises with various tools in the office, you know, car keys, clapping, dropping something on the desk and so on. And the result can be recorded and it can really help to reduce MPO issues which might arise. So occasionally clients have a particular loud noise issue um, and it's one thing in particular and we can try and simulate that in the office and relate it to their uncomfortable loudness levels. And that's just what uh, my third case study is about. So this person came in and was complaining that cutlery and plates on their bench top or when they took them out of the dishwasher um, were causing some distress when wearing the hearing aid. So after dropping some things on my desk, um, trying to simulate this the best, you'll see at about 1,500 we were hitting fairly close to their limits and given we were in a quiet, you know, clinical office performing this test, it might be advisable uh, to lower the hearing aid parameters here to ensure we don't hit this limit in their own home. One of the final topics I wanted to talk about was counselling. Uh, I want to touch on some of the aspects it can be used for because it really does follow that if the clinician can obtain all of this information out of the assessment that we can relay some of this information to the client. One of the big questions though is that how can we make this information stick with the clients? How do we ensure that the information we're delivering them can be firstly retained and then secondly retained correctly? Because we know from a multitude of studies that visual stimuli can assist and visible speech mapping is certainly a way that we can convey this information better. So yeah, the age old question is do I need a hearing aid? Well we're now able to show them aided versus unaided comparisons. Uh, we could demonstrate the talking of a partner or a companion in the room and, and show what kind of vocal effort is required for them to hear well. Um, and we can do this with demonstration hearing aids which is becoming um, much more popular in clinics. You know, why do I need two hearing aids or that age old comment from end users, oh I need two, well yes you do, you have two ears and we need to fit you up on both sides. And now we have a method to show them why, the aided versus unaided comparisons uh, and also binaural comparisons that we can show on screen. And it's very easy to display the left and right sides together uh, and it makes the testing a lot quicker as well. And what can I expect the hearing aid to achieve? Well, we can explain their dynamic range restrictions if it's appropriate um, and we can introduce hearing rehab techniques early into the discussion uh, which is beneficial because we're not placing all the emphasis on improvement um, through just the hearing aid technology alone. Uh, and lastly for parents, I think giving them a live showing of the child's ability once fitted uh, is very powerful. And we can of course also do this in the hearing instrument test box. So if we have a non-compliant child, as a lot of them may be with real ear measurements, uh, we can certainly use the test box to help us out. So my final uh, case study here is a counselling example. And we're using the live voice activation here. Um, and it's showing how much vocal effort is required for the client to hear both in the unaided and aided situation. So I've used it to demonstrate a softly spoken companion speaking from another room and 
people on why they might be having difficulties around the home speaking to each other. You know, typically someone from the kitchen with the television on. So it's a really fantastic way of showing improvement to parents or caregivers of children. Um, and it's also this type of counselling that is really only limited by the clinician's imagination. I know mean, whatever scenario you can come up with, we can generally be simulated um, and use this personal style of counselling for the hearing aid wearer and their extended family. So this concludes today's visible speech mapping webinar and I hope from the information that I've provided you, you might see how beneficial it is as a tool for clinicians to be certain of what they're providing for their clients and that the hearing aids are meeting the brief. Really, the options that can be achieved are almost endless and perhaps I think its greatest achievement is ability to really quickly validate the hearing aid settings in a much more efficient and meaningful way than those traditional REM tests. And it also provides the clinician with a vast array of interpretation options for themselves and then also to use for counselling for the end user if that's appropriate. So thank you for attending today.